Um, that, so we'll do that. And then beyond that, we'll have today's presentation and go on to some of the activities afterwards. Two of the, um, you are seeing with legacy members here today, but we're so delighted. Um, if you think back, we originally started as an organization in 1978, so that started me down the, the road, digging out newsletters and seeing what I could say. And um, I found one that was, this is the, the very first Minnesota culture newsletter, um, which I think was about June of 78 or something like that. And since this is the first newsletter of a new organization called the Minnesota Quilters, the purpose of this organization is to find and to unite quilters and quilt enthusiasts throughout the state of Minnesota. And then it goes on to say that they will be able to come in for meetings and attend exhibitions and classes and all of that. And um, they get a chance to share and collaborate on their ideas. And here we are many years later, and we still have some of those first rounding people with us. Um, Helen, I wanted to ask, excuse me, so getting confused on my, my founding partners here. Um, Susan, I wanted to ask you, were you part of the initial that helped us sign up or did you come in a few years later? I was at the YWCA. I was at the YWCA when we met with uh, just a small table, and, and uh, yeah, and then I was at Normal Bunkless House when we actually organized. All right, so she's part of the original, original. I do know a little bit though, and then I, after looking through the newsletters, I know that you were more as a public relations person in the early 1980s, and then I think in, was it 83 or 85, you were president for the Guild? So you've been participating for a while and lending your talents. Um, the other thing that I'd like to tell you, let me just go through here. So um, one of the things that you did was you owned a successful quilt and fiber art shop called Color Blue Quilts and Textiles. I think you have maybe another sort of shop before that. And so has been part of the event, you know, people who are some product quilters. And what Susan was really known for was for stocking products with quilters and those who wanted painting and dyeing and fabric manipulation and were really into the fiber arts. So she was, so they want me to move. All right, sorry, we're getting the technology worked out as always. So you have that. Okay that store. And then in 2003, Susan was voted in as a culture of the year for Minnesota culture. So you've been, your work and your contributions has been valued for a long, long time. Um, I think one of the things that you did, you've written many books. So I, I think it was about seven books and then contributing to some other books, but with an emphasis on fabric art and textile arts and all of that kind of thing. And you can still find them online. Uh, look for there's Susan Stein under Amazon and uh, probably eBay and other places. You can still find them. I was very tempted that you may order the couple last week. Without mm -hmm. <laughs> further ado, Susan, I guess I will let you go ahead and give your talk. I think we're going to have the people who need a couple of holders and folders, and she's going to provide them if you want. Where I'll get out of the way. Thank you so much. It's really great to see old friends and be all your friends. We gave a choice of July and October, and I said, Well, October, please can we be? And we just, well, it was she might, she might die. Yeah. Well, it's all right. Maybe pull it a little bit out. How many? This is going to be this. Um, so many people were great. Well, we apologize for sitting, but we can stay in the morning and bring this up. Well, we will start with a little talk about how we started. And it was because this is part of the thing that we saw in the 80s. And we went to a cool child in Ramona um, that was at the museum. And we saw Zephyr quilts there, and we went home. Oh, we're exploring. <laughs> she just said, 
perfect chairman for the Missouri teachers at the time. And um, she said, okay, you're on the way to the how to make stimulus more interesting. And so that's all just got started in the early 80s. And it's um, merged over the years as I give away notes or to sell them and yeah, make other ones. And so, but I've always got a couple dozen simpler quotes around because I think they are so fun to make and they can be a diet. Um, and so I'm going to show you uh, 26 quotes that I've done, like I said, over the years. And um, hopefully give you some ideas, maybe for some of the orphan blocks that you have around <laughs> or barking fabrics or um, just ways to make things a little more interesting. So you want to start with that cute slide. If you look at this closely after the reading with some of the lovely members that have heard of um, it's a signature quilt. And I didn't think really much colors because I saw Paul Claudius in the 80s. We did a lot of solid color fabrics because back then there was such fabric and quarters. And so we had a nice bowls of just solid housing. And so I made blocks that had squares in the middle. That could and then I took the blocks to a meeting and wrote a little bit of the same way around it so we sit around and do the sign now. So I chose blocks that have sort of the same density of pieces. That's one thing that makes a stack hammer, I think, is if you don't try to do two fingers patterns, but um, I'm just choosing them for the center block to swing. And then to fix them, I did the triangle the squares and the line base. And to do the tweaks one, the black ties all those colors together. And then I did some shaping and some hand raise from quilting. Um, so that I think is really well, I want to call me in the kitchen, come up here, I did that much, and I did the kitchen stuff by her. Pink one is next. And this one, I call Monet versus Pollux. That was fun. We had hand dyers at the store, the called store, and Mara Cusera did very, very, very soft colors with her dyed fabrics. And Mark Virgil did very, sorry, did very wide colors and textures with her dyeing. And so I split the square alternate blocks between those two diagrams and then took a cherry wood bundle, a hand dyed banner, the brainer, and split that into the lightest values and the darkest values. And so I did the diagonal rows. It's all the same there, right? but the blocks are not the only thing that we that's what I like to do, is to make the sample box you have to, well, to do, because you don't only have to do each box once. Um, but it is just makes it interesting to look at and to make. And then this is what you get. Bring us up to check out. Okay. Yeah, I it's, no, this one is from class that I taught in one of the girls. 
I lost it. It's, it's gone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the owl did. Jenny, no. Is it that? No. There we go. So we have a lot of different samples of that. We have to do it. We started with a fabric that I had up to me. And so I thought it was the way it works. Um, <laughs> or who? So that was fun to cut big chunks of large prints without putting them up into teeny little pieces. And so you could feature those, you could do the different sampler techniques, because I taught you know, everything from applique to the triangle squares and quarter points, triangle squares, and so on. We got it all in, but we could do something a lot more interesting than just a plain sampler group. And then a lot of cabins went around the outside. Yeah. Um, and of course, um, yeah, it's always fun to do my things. I still do them a lot. And um, the theme blocks, that might be something that's sitting in your stash. Some fabric that wants to be highlighted in a quilt and not cut up into little pieces. So think about that. Usually when I start something like this, I put the theme blocks, the feature fabrics up on the wall and look at them for a few days and then pick out other fabrics that go with them. And so a quilt like this, you can use maybe 10 or 15 other fabrics go with your theme blocks. And um, you just want to make sure that when you do your sample blocks, you have contrast because with something this busy, um, you don't want things to mush up and have all medium values or something like that. You want to have some contrast. Next one is like the first sampler in the series. <laughs> and it's more of a traditional setting. But it's all Granny's trunk fabric from RJR from the early 80s. <laughs> I don't know if some of you still have this or not, but it became a blue cranberry. <laughs> and it came in these colors. And so I decided, okay, to make this more interesting for me, I will choose all patterns that have grand granny, grandmothers uh, in the name. And so you'll see Grandmother's Fan and Granny's Trunk and all kinds of patterns like that. And so this was, of course, notorious later on for fading like crazy. <laughs> Granddaughter and maybe went on the wall. It turned gray pretty fast. <laughs> so when we started our store in 1980, but they didn't have quilting stuff. And so we we had to use what was available. It wasn't always the best. <laughs> it was funny because when we went to quilt market to buy fabrics, when I first started going, it's all women, and then all of a sudden the men in the three-piece suits were walking around. And they discovered that we could spend money on fabric. And we started getting our own lines of fabric in better quality. And so that was a great thing. Yeah. Uh, but it's pretty funny to see all of a sudden men go, oh, pretty interesting. This is one that I had a really odd colored dye bundle from Deb One. And um, so I did sampler blocks with that again. Choosing blocks that were the same density of piecing, not some that had great big pieces and some that had little tiny pieces, but I, I will like do all nine patches or all 25 patches or all 16 patches or something like that sometimes to keep things unified. But my goal with this one was to take that bundle 
And um, since it was fairly low contrast in the colors to make the triangles stand out enough and to do the lattice in the same fabrics. And so have a nice quilt, but have it be still distinct enough so that you could tell what the blocks are. This one came about because I worked on the Singer Sewing Library quilting books. They had not done any quilting books. And this was in the late 80s. Um, and Sidekas, who was the head of the publisher at the time, said, well, you can't have bread in the bar. Can't make quilts without. And we convinced him. I also introduced them to cherry wood fabrics in gradations from light to dark. They had never heard of those. And it was very, very interesting doing books with them. Um, I did four or five, and everything's by committee. There's an art director, there's an editor, there's a sample supervisor. And um, so it was, like I said, very interesting. They had shoppers that went out and told the stores and bought the fabrics. And, um, so this was the scraps that were left after doing the first book. And so it's a strippy scenario um, with just, again, using the values in each book to make the blocks distinct enough, but very coordinated looking. And here I used white instead of black to set them off. This is a recent one, um, and it's called Metal Flowers because this was a bundle that Jones uh, Gradation sold years ago. And Jones got back. And um, so I wanted to base it out on that bundle of fabric. And then black, of course, always sets things off well. Um, but it was really, really fun to do. They're 18 inch blocks. And so each so block. This group? That's this what their budget is. Uh, um, sample blocks. And, uh, you know, pretty traditional patterns. You'll see card trip there and um, other things that you recognize, but then there's strips of just triangle squares or squares or rectangle, and just the plain strips. So I used a lot of my boutiques uh, to do the uh, finishing of 18 inch blocks and then arranged them on the wall to work with each other. And so I think this is really uh, Minus small pieces, <laughs> I think six inch sampler blocks are as small as I would like to go um, because anything smaller gets pretty hard, <laughs> pretty precise. And here is another one that I did recently. This has eight hand layers back and um, so there's and the people who aren't even with us anymore are included here, like Marianne Martell's The Sun Printed Birds and Sumac. Uh, she used to go to Bayfield, Wisconsin with planks in Louisville and load up the van with birds and um, other plant life and then go home again, sun print, which means painting white fabric, or she used a, a lot of Colored boutiques also, and the, putting the plant material on and then exposing it to the sun. And when it was dry, these things were printed. And recently I found out it can do the opposite. It does it anyway. Um, <laughs> so, you know. Um, and then lots of handwriters that I really, really 
know, those pieces that file is dwindling and um, that's not so easy to find anymore when hand dyers selling their stuff. But um, the sample blocks are here, but they aren't the main focus. There are other interesting things to look at. This one's a big one. This is another block of the month. Uh, using a theme fabric again. So this has a, it's sideways, but there's a um, scene, a southwestern scene in those two large strips there. And then if we did one or two blocks for the class. Um, and again, the sampler blocks were there, but um, not the only thing that you get to look at. And this one, a lot of people took this class on, and Trudy Johnson um, did one in oriental fabric, and then she used her embroidery machine to do real fancy uh, oriental motifs in any of the square areas, any parts that she would get something into. It was so fabulous. Um, and we had everything from zoo animals to endangered species to, you know, the same kind of theme um, carried out in these quilts. And they were really fun to see at the end of the year what people came up with. Um, they learned all their techniques, but it was a really, really fun way to do it. And um, it grew on your design wall as you went through the year. Next slide is yeah. excellent technique samplers. Because I like mixed media a lot, so you look at this cell behind me because it's got maybe not working under under the melted fabric to uh, just every kind of hair oil technique that I could pick up. This one was another block of the month, but this was called the journal because as we went through the year, we did all of those weird things like rusting down. And people were going back to the farm to find rusting down. They were switching all kinds of places for different kinds of love that they had built. And we just really had fun with this class. So you can see that behind the horses there, that's rusted fabric. And yep, <laughs> um, there's photography in there, there's melted stuff in there, and painted, and there's even some Angelina, which is a real, real shiny fiber that you've melted together. Um, and just had, again, a great time playing. And that's what I would encourage you to do if you do any kind of scent work is use it as an opportunity to play. Oh, sorry. So the block with the tree in it, this is melted felt. This is the Angelina is down here. That was a jelly printing plate that melted. Um, and there's cheesecloth over this commercial fabric and woven ribbons. So 
anything goes. Um, these are not meant to be on God. Um, this does hang in the better uh, But use your goods as an opportunity to experiment, to play. We're going to take any of these apart again and look at them. I would welcome that. They don't get out much anymore. This one is a technique sampler of dyeing techniques. And so there's everything from clamped quarters, money quarters, um, to folded, to twisted. And um, so the dyeing thing can also be quite interesting. And uh, don't do a whole lot of buying of large pieces. That's a lot. Um, but to do these little things is really fun. And you just start with the white fabric. I don't buy much colored fabric anymore. It's all white or black. <laughs> and um, you can end up with pretty exciting stuff. It's a setting that's perfectly normal, but um, the blocks are pretty interesting to look at, I think. It's what I call pick a leaf again. So lots of different um, techniques and, you know, the colored foil and the painting, melting, all things like that. Um, and the setting, again, is pretty normal, but you can look at it for a while and be interested in it. It's a stamping center. So, ring wrapped around the wind block, or stamping with leaves, or stamping with carved erasers, or stamping with washers, um, stamping with prints, um, just anything that, was, um, that can be painted. Put the head paint put on, a, on it and stamped on the fabric. That's a lot of fun. Um, and again, a pretty average setting, but sometimes you don't need to do anything fancy with the, the lattice work if you've got blocks that are different. <laughs> This is a jelly printing sampler. Yeah, jelly printing is taking gelatin and putting paint on it, manipulating the paint sometimes, um, doing multiple prints from it, or just dribbling paint onto the gelatin and then putting fabric down it and picking the paint up that way. Um, and so there's construction fence used here more stuff that you see all over town. Um, and lots of ways to put paint onto the gelatin. And then one of them has a plant, a dried plant pressed into the paint and that's used for the printing. Uh, the, your imagination, you know, you can just let it go and just, do all kinds of crazy things. You now have artificial gelatin, so you don't have to make it every time. Yes? Using white uh, fabric Yes. I am, but it's not necessary. She she asked if I use PFD fabric prepared for drying fabric as my white fabric, and I do. But the key to picking your fabric for printing is fine weave because it picks up the patterns better. So it doesn't have to be prepared for dyeing. It can be a EMA, 
of any kind. But I think Kona is a little worse. Uh, I love Kona for my black, but I use a fine weave for the white. So it really picks up every nuance of what I'm doing. And I used to go to places where I would teach and make multiple pans of gelatin. And I always wondered what the maids thought in the morning when you saw all these knocks gelatin, which is in the waste basket. Um, and then, of course, getting to the floor, you know, without refrigeration and all those things. That was really fun. So now when I go somewhere, I use foam rubber. So, but it is something that is just really, really fun. And I still, together with friends, um, jelly printing parties. This is a sampler of playing with the filters in my Photoshop. And I just have the cheap Photoshop. It's really old. But I can put a picture of a Gerber or a in there and play with the filters and spin it and do all kinds of things. And then I printed those images out on silk. And so it's a sampler of the film on my computer. But that's all the same river on Daisy. It's just manipulating. This is a sampler of resists. And resists can be flour and water painted on the fabric and left dry. It can be paint sticks. It can be crayons. It can be acrylic medium. It can be wax. Anything that will keep the paint from sinking into the fabric. And then you take the resist out, usually, and are left with the original black or white. Um, but resists are a lot of fun and you can you can do all kinds of things um, to just keep the paint from going in different places. You can also do a mechanical resist, which is uh, bottom row, second block, crunched up so that the paint doesn't go everywhere or hide like tie-dye with string or rubber bands, uh, but it's all a way to make uh, paint stay away from silk. So there's no sewing in those blocks. None, except for it was painted with a fork triangle, fork square, tangle, whatever. I took a placemat that was cork and put it into those shapes and printed it on the fabric. And so it's not any sewing. And so you could use a compressed sponge or anything with a texture because I like the less solid look. I like the, the texture of the sponge or cork. And very easy made way I guess that would count. And yeah, this would be a good thing to do with kids. And this is a screen printed sampler. So everything you can do with a stretched piece of polyester. I use embroidery hoops or official screens, but you can put uh, fugitive media, they call it, on the screen, and that screens down onto the fabric. You can put um, threaded paper on, under your screen. You can put Kellon shape painted things under your screen stencils. I don't teach screen printing as the hard way or the expected way. It's using household items and masking tape on the screen um, or so many ways to do screen printing without uh, 
rubbing the machine and buying the special chemicals and things like that. Uh, I started here with the blocks that I had done uh, dyeing on and then put the black screen printing on top. How did I expose them? Um, that's what I'm saying. You don't have to use that machine. Uh, the screen has masking tape on it, or the screen has a stencil under it, taped to it. Um, you're inking through the screen and through whatever you've got underneath it or on it, and that paint goes onto the fabric. And I'm just using like credit cards to for squeegees, um, just a real simple method. And now we're into another category, which is one of a kind. This is based on a book by Judy Hopkins, a really old book. I don't know if it's in the library or not. Uh, if it isn't, let me know because I have two copies and I'll be happy to donate one. Um, but she also did another edition of it called um, Design Your Own Quilt. And what it is, is taking orphan blocks or a theme fabric or something and putting those up on the wall and then doing four inch sand block and arranging them all around your other uh, theme blocks and making a really fun project out of it. And so this was a bad base that I got from Barbara York, um, who went to somewhere in the Caribbean and bought me this bird fabric. And, you know, it was, it was such a little piece. So I got two big blocks, two little blocks out of it, and that's it. And then I had this variegating fabric that's on the border that I cut up along with black, of course, um, to do the sampler block. These are easy sampler blocks. She gives you a menu of blocks that you can do, and she even gives you templates to make them with if you want. Um, and so arranging those and choosing these simple blocks to highlight whatever your, maybe it's pieces, I don't know, one lady do her wedding, um, and Homer hankies, um, anything you've got that's about eight inches square or something that you can make up to eight inches square. Or go big as long as it's multiples of four inches. So it'll fit with the little four inch sample box. It's perfect. And, you know, I've just had every description of what people dig out of their stick to do this with. I think that goes back to the 80s or something when the twins were in the series and they had Hanky said you were supposed to wait. Okay. Turn the dome white. This was a rich table that my mother embroidered. Um, she was born in 19. 1919, <laughs> um, and it was it had a big hole in it, so I mended that. And uh, I just wanted to use that center embroidery for something. And so, as long as it's a multiple of four, so this is a 16 inch embroidered rich cloth cover, and uh, then you can surround it with the four inch sampler blocks. So here's a sampler quilt. But that is a really secondary to the whole thing because you're looking at her brain. So was some photos that my husband took at Lake McDonald in Glacier Park. 
and it was a twilight, so they're very blue. And so I just chose fabrics that would go with those colors to look like pine trees. Well, the, the pictures that come out on the printer are not quite eight by ten like they say. And so I had to make them a little bit bigger. And yeah, it makes just a fine. Mm. And I don't know if you like me, but when I go to a show, there are a few impulse buys along the way. And, you know, these Indonesian batik blocks are so tempting. And so this one was masks. And, you know, what do you do with it when you get it? But um, a friend had given me as a gift a bundle of hand dyed fabric that was in the oranges and blues. Ah. And so this one doesn't have quite as many different samplers in it, but it was still fun to make that there and, and figure out what to do with her little gift of, you know, this little bundle of fabric and then one block. And so, again, Putting it well um, to play with it is key ingredient. And these last three are what I call background samplers <laughs> because this the sample blocks are the background for the overlay of the brown grid. Um, I used dyed bundles of cherry wood for the brown. And the pink and the green and the gray. Um, so the sample blocks are there, but very underplayed. And the red sashing stands out and then the brown over the top. And people ask me if I cut up the quilt and inserted the brown. No, I don't have that much courage. I applicate it over the top. Um, but I do like to play with the gradations, the light to the dark. And when I had this quilt at the Egan High School for their uh, show, uh, the principal said, it's like that, it's really faded. I just, uh, These are the weird colored fabrics that I used uh, in an earlier sampler. But here, I used to, as a background, I call this the Colorado tree because you see so many dead trees in the desert. And so I dyed a piece of organza. It wasn't quite as sheer as I had hoped, but it's a, it's a lightweight fabric. And uh, applicate that over the same blocks. The same idea that here. This is a, an Indian man, woman looking at each other. Uh, the sample blocks, I tried to choose ones that looked Native American and then applicate them over the blocks using a muslin that had um, somewhat sheer quality. So you can see the block through and then quilted it as if the people aren't there. Um, it just ended it. And I had a neat striped fabric that I could use for the pottery bowl. Um, so this one was fun to do to make it, try to make it look Native American. Again, using just solid color. When I had my first store from 80 to 85, um, calico was the only quilting fabric you could get besides solids. And I didn't buy another calico or look at one for a couple years after I closed that store because all those little flowers. Um, I think that's why I got into hand dyed 
buying hand-dyed fabrics. You know, you have so much interest to them and there's no repeat. Are there any other questions? Thank you so much to the full person. Mm -hmm. uh, uh -huh. Uh, I use Kuma Black specifically um, because I love color and I want to out. Black does the best. Um, there isn't anything else quite that won't compete with the other colors. Um, you have a great sense of uh, design and color. Um, did you study the art? No, it's not in English. Which made my mother happy, but um, she was happy when I started working on the book because then I was sort of trying to finish. Yes? No, are you going to write any more? Um, publishing whole industry has changed so much. When I did the Singer books, uh, well, I did one for a notions company because I knew Sharon Holper and she had notions, so I did a book with her. And I did a book for AQS, American Culture Society. They were kind of difficult. The singer people were really fun to work with. Um, I would, we would have an ideation and it could be, they'd fly in somebody from a these people sit and, and think, what would you want in a quilting book? Um, and Cindy would write those ideas on raised books and put them on the books in front of the room. And uh, then uh, I would take those ideas and try to make designs that we can so and put together in through a book. And uh, one of the samplers that I showed you, um, Rainforest sampler, that came out of one of the singer books because they wanted me to take all the individual things and put them into one quilt. And so that's how that came about. Well, but I would go out to Nantanga and on the samples after the community. <laughs> Um, decided what fabrics we would use and stuff like that. And there were like eight people in the room, so like, and it was really, really fun. And then they'd go upstairs to photography, and then sometimes they'd come back and start, you can't do that. And, um, and we'd remake it. And, um, so we, we, we did that. And then the last time I worked with them, they, they started doing more stuff which I'm not really great at uh, for the graphics. And they started sending the projects out to California for photography. And I went, that's kind of difficult <laughs> because I used to bring the boxes, boxes of bags labeled according to the spreadsheet and everything so they could photograph from here and then I could take them back home again. Um, so the singer ended. Um, and Rodale, I did quite a few projects for them, but when they decided they didn't want to do quilting books. So it just kind of dwindled out. Thought of maybe doing a dark one or something. Um, did one many, many years ago. Could probably do another article for a magazine or something. Um, but as far as doing a book, it's quite, uh, an operation. <laughs> you need some money. <laughs> to be a photographer. Anybody else? Marcy. Um, I am not afraid to fill up the wastebasket. Um, oh, she she wanted to know how fearless I am about making the blocks, and if they aren't successful, um, I give up on. Um, I 
Voting involves time and money, and you want to use the wisely. <laughs> um, I have one friend who says you, you can't or throw anything away because you can always put paint on it or foil or something like that and, you know, working on it. And I, I do sometimes resurrect things by doing that, but one thing I do to prevent failures is use the design board. Um, even when I haven't sewn the block together, I'll put the little pieces up and look at them from a distance or you can always use your phone or take a picture, lay them on the floor and take a picture because you can really tell right away without sewing anything and having to rip it out, let's work or not. But I, I don't, I try not to charge ahead without taking the time to analyze. Uh -huh. You talk about the written photos that are hanging behind you. That one um, is all leaves. I've done many, many leaf quilts. Um, if you're familiar with Sue Benner, um, it's kind of based on her style with the uh, black lines kind of waving through and, and the leaves cut out positive, negative, that kind of thing. Um, both of these quilts start with a black piece of fabric on the wall. And then I choose or I make elements to put on them and arrange, arrange, arrange until I'm happy. And then I usually just pin them in place. And both of these quilts have just red quilting on them. So I do not uh, try to make that a perfect red. Uh, I will draw one horizontal and one vertical line with chalk to start. Then I work out to the sides and the top and the bottom, trying not to make um, But I use a walking foot. I find that a lot more relaxing than free motion quilting. And um, the quilts are coming wrong. I mean, the little pieces are fused on, but the blocks themselves are just pin on visually. And then quilt them down. And if you quilt every half inch or an inch, um, touch everything, it has a little corner of a leaf or something that's curling up. I'll put a little tiny glue under it. That works. And this one is just a real hodgepodge of things. The But the elements, as I call them, are collected maybe over years. Uh, this is a piece of somebody else's marble fabric. There's, oh, okay. There's a piece of silk that I impulse by on edge. Oh. I think it's from my bond. Um, and this is Wonder Under that's painted. And you want it to rip. You want it to not be perfect. Uh, painting and uh, pieces that I've collected uh, and bought. Um, but again, it's quilted to hold everything in place. This is a Wendy Richardson hand I piece of lace. Uh, and so that was a, an interesting piece of fabric that was red, and I took discharge paste tint uh, to take some of the color off. Um, but it's just playing and playing and playing and collecting. And sometimes people will give me things, then I'll go, I don't think I can use that, but you know, two years down the line. It's the perfect thing. Um, so, the question more about that, huh? What is mink? Foil. 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 Foil.
Right here? No, no, that was the first one. Black dot here. About the circle here? No, up in the corner. Yeah, that's a For one here. Yeah. And it comes out foil like. Well, it, I use Lumiere paint. Yeah. It's just metallic paint. That's fine. That's fine. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> what is your favorite um, paint to use? Well, lately, when the pandemic hit, I started doing sketchbooks because there was so much, there were workshops online and, and there were so many things you could do without um, having to go to a fact store or anything like that. You know, I just bought a sketchbook and, and played with paint. So I got used to using acrylics, just uh, Liquitex acrylics in it. And um, I tend now to grab those, even for fabric. I always used to use Dakar paints um, that were for fabric. But now that I'm always doing wall hangings, um, it doesn't matter if it's a fabric paint. And so the nice thing about the acrylics is that oh, it's so many colors <laughs> and they're the right consistency for screen grading or painting or stenciling or stamping. You don't have to do anything to them. Whereas when I used the card, there were four different kinds of paint that I bought and I still use dime but by a card if I want really soft fabric when I'm done. So it looks like it's been dyed rather than painted. It was still used dye to flow quite a bit. But I tend to grab acrylics now. Do you add medium to the acrylics? No, because my stuff won't be washed. And I don't care about the hand so much because it's going to be on the wall. I just wanted to add one thing. Um, when you look at the Art speed and a student grade. And the art speed has the intent to come. When you use the student grade, which is probably half the price, you you frequently cannot get the kind of intent. Curve. Uh -huh. Well, I'm using the one called Basics. Yeah, that's um, Basics comes, that's probably a student grade. Um, I think I would have a lens. Student grade for lots of places. Mm -hmm. Susan, I was going to ask you, you are really productive. There's so many lovely pieces, and I love the way that you use that four and a half inch grid format, used it in many different ways. Um, are you ever selling your pieces? Oh, yes. Yes. Um, I will sell anything. Um, my son has taken a lot of my stuff. I still have over 100 coats of tall. And if anybody ever wants to come over, please left my business cards there. First off, the uh, email because I have a new email, which is Susan Steinworks at Gmail. Um, my phone number's on there. Text me, whatever. If you want to come over and look at quilts, please do. I have uh, several series you do with friends uh, challenges that are like twelve by twenty. What? Twelve ones. We did one in month for a year. Just couldn't bring all the stuff I would play for. Um, but I always happy to show off the quilts, and I also love it when people come over and play with me. Granny's done that several times, and um, so just come and play with paint, or you know, you can give me a few bucks for paint. You don't need to bring anything. Um, or if you want to bring in a few friends and actually have a tutorial, we can do that. Um, but I really love it when people come over and they look like there to stop at 35B. Um, so, what a great staff. I always provide chocolates. Um, 
I have to tell this story. Use the microphone. Use the microphone. Susan, I came into your shop about 25 years ago and I didn't know cherry wood from applewood. And um, I wanted to make a queen size quilt for my husband's wedding. Okay. <laughs> His brother's wedding, I'm sorry. And I, I was just green as grass. And you said, well, you got my idea. And when you put up that one with the um, gradations, I just had this trigger, this flashback. And you suggested that I might do all the um, Oh my God. Blocks. <laughs> the blocks that have the, that have the, that are square. Okay. And um, you suggested that I do the gradations and we wanted to do it's peach and teal. And you said, just, you know, you go and get grenade and eat gradations of fairy wood. Anyway, you told me how to do it and how to think about it as a light source. Uh, I, I brought home everything I needed, and my husband said, God, he's not even your brother. He just invested 400 bucks. Yes. And then I had to buy the matching threads. And when I said, Well, gosh, I said, I had this expert, and she's so God. I heard And I, I wonder, you know, later uh, when I look at those pictures, it because I mean, I have since been filling their coffers. Let me, uh, thanks to you, Susan. Thank you very much. Excuse me, just a call. Thanks to everyone who was able to be here and listen to this, and I hope that we had as much success with uh, the people on Zoom getting to see all of the quilts once we figured it out. Yeah, let's just ask. Can our other members stand up or wave a hand or something? I know there's a few here. There's at least one, two. All right. So that's just okay. I just want to say that you know, this organization amazes me. And every time we step up and volunteer to do something or participate, and it can be, you know, the simplest thing from helping people check in when they come to a meeting, helping with a class, teaching a friend at a retreat, how to do something that they haven't done before. And it's, it's the willingness to chip in and to everybody just to step forward and do a little bit that makes the whole come together. And so I have to thank Susan and our other charter members. Dan, do any of you know what your, your number was? We used to number our membership. <laughs> right, so Susan's 49. You're what? Number one. Number one, can you light it to him? Number one, it's not right there. Bonnie got in there at 62. So, thank you so much. So, this, this to me is a very special session. I just want to thank you again for coming out. I had the pleasure of taking the crap with you very COVID at the White Bear Quilt Store, and we have outside the parking lot to do a little bit of it. It's great for the fun. Thank you for being here today. Oh, it's time for a break. How much time?
about 15 minutes and then we'll regroup and go on to other topics. Thanks. Um, sewing machine. Um, these are still they're sitting in a box, and I'm trying to work up the show. So Erica was sitting. Erica already got her. She didn't know she wants something. Sandra uh, Morshatz, Beth Gardner, Heather White, Sharon Blackie, and Jody Murphy. Are you here? Okay, so you can come over and get your prize. What's your name? Jody Murphy. Thank you, Erica. And I have um, two quilts in my office. The Marcia Olson, she here? Okay, I'm trying to get all the quilts back home. Um, and the other thing, if you are ready to sign up for your hotels for St. Paul, they're already set up. The um, visitors, visitors Bureau did that for us. There is a poster in the back that um, has the blocks of um, Hotels, I think there's seven of them. Best Western is the one that's connected to the Rivers Edge Convention Center. So you can call and make your reservation, tell them that you want the Minnesota Culture is free. Does anybody else have an announcement? Okay, show and tell then. Does anybody have any show and tell they brought with them today? Okay, shall we do those first then? We need to have All right, so if you're bringing up your quilt for show and tell, you need to stand out here so that it gets on the towel. And if you could sign up here. Put your name. I'm going to switch me. It's the good thing to do. It's time it was on the card. It's probably so. Is it there? This is what happens when you switch rooms, everything goes paperless. Yeah. 
Yeah. All right, uh, this baby's been in a, um, a dresser for about 20 years or more. And it was Sue Stein's, one of her first classes of where we, we made uh, blocks, they had all this African fabric. And we just, you know, we learned how to make all these different, you know, art tricks and all these different uh, blocks, as she said. And then I, back then, I couldn't find really good fabric. I could fussy cut for all the animals, get them in the right scale. So I thought, well, just, just throw them on. Of course, my husband said, what's this ghost giraffe here? And Sue just told me today, she goes, well, you can just color it. You know, just put some paint on it and make them up. So anyway, this, uh, now after this lecture, I'm just motivated to it is. It is a fun. What's her name? Oh, Meg Divine. Oh, I brought two calls today. Oh, Diane, I brought two calls today. This one um, was a disappearing hourglass um, from a class by Britta Nelson. And my a friend of mine gave me all these fabrics, and I still have a lot left. So I'll be making a lot of these uh, disappearing quilts. Um, and I didn't put a couple of pieces in the bag, which I don't usually do. But I have so much of this fabric, I thought I needed to use it. And then, uh, this is So my daughter's husband is finishing off the downstairs level. And in the corner, they're putting a red fireplace, you know, a fire stool. And uh, I saw, I got this fabric for, of a free table. Um, and I just loved it. So um, I put this together and I haven't given it to them yet. I'm just finishing the binding. But this was kind of fun because on the, on the back of it, it's all this black and white floral. And this is where I quilted it from. It's going around these parts. I hadn't done that before. So that was good fun for me. I worked on a sample in 2023 as a group, but I'm, um, that sews on people powered machines, so hand cranes and treadles. So these blocks were all made on either a hand crank or a treadle. I didn't keep track of which of my machines I made them on. Um, and these are the ones I like the best in R12, but there's some that there's definitely um, higher skill or, or more challenging quilts from blocks. And um, it was really a ton of fun. And this meeting today, seeing Susan Sanders is great because I've been struggling with how to put these together. And now I have a fresh perspective on them and different ideas how to do them. Mary Tag from Modern Week. Man, I have two black calls today. The first one I got. The poppy fabric at some shop in Western Minnesota. Um, and so the orientation is actually this way on the bed, but um, just needed something big to keep those poppies alive. And the next one is a uh, thread I got uh, from Connecting Threads, I believe. And they actually now put out a white one, but I did it with the black. And um, I did this at the um, Fall Quilters Retreat at Milwaukee. It's a lot of for my niece um, at 
we may quoting was translated from the Father. When Diane wrote, this is the third Diane for showing tabs for what I put. I'm finding Matthew and his wife, you all were got married on February 29th. <laughs> but anyway, this is a wedding quilt that I made for him and her family. And I uh, did not have a quilt before the show, so I came back and said, What am I going to do? And then I remembered I had this really cool roller to show. It was from my new favorite shop, Bob Wall Quilt. And um, it's just, it's kind of a wavy on one side and then a smaller wavy on the other side. I built it myself. And I thought that came out pretty good. It's a whole quilt that rather because oh okay <laughs> okay I brought this because I got the Native American women that was in the store years ago. This was in this Queen Club culture in 1998, so it's old. But Susan always had gifts they never seen anywhere else. Her major shows. Never, never had what she had. So I just, that's one of my favorites. I mean, they're all favorites, but some are more than others. Renee? Cheryl Pimen. You have the mic. Cheryl Pimen. <laughs> um, this was in Duluth. I figured not everybody here might have made it to Duluth, so I thought it was a lot of fun to do. I just did rows of vertical strips. It's from a photo I saw from mine, and I thought I can do that. And I really kind of wanted it to look like that. This is more like the Pinterest, what you were aiming for and what you got. This is the one you got. But, but I really enjoyed it. So, and I especially like about the beading and buttons and things. And I didn't have to go out and buy anything. So. Okay. Okay. I like Kathy Brooks and I finished up from the month London's here. Both these quilts are made out of Liberty of London fabric and I've been collecting Liberty since I went to college in England and it used to be that you could only buy the fabric in England and um, you can buy it anywhere. It's still expensive though. So um, it's called Ties and Parts and the wheels are English paper pieced, and then they're hand appliqued onto the quilt, and then it's um, hand quilted. So it took me about eight years to do this one. And I just sewed a bunch of strips of Liberty. I love Liberty. It's not, it's not very impactful from a distance, but how close the detail that they have because it's such fine cotton is just really lovely and it's so comfortable to sleep under. And here's a small one that I spent um, the last two years making. It's hand appliqued and hand quilted and it's just a clamshell baby quilt. It's at Liberty. It is in the back is also Liberty, which is typical of what they do, but um, it is it is Liberty. I just like this bear to sleep under so much fun. Uh, 
Hi, Laura Nagel from Apple Valley. I knew no matter where I stood in the line for show and tell, this is going to be going to be pathetic. But I brought it because it was just started. I think just the watering can was done. It was on the free table. And it was an MK pattern that I would always wanted to do. In fact, I wanted to do it so much that I bought the pattern twice. They're both out on the free table. <laughs> Well, anyway, here it is. It's finished, and I've been waiting to bring it for show and tell. Now I can give it to my friend who likes to garden all the time. And when I saw that my other friend was here, I said, I have to go before you because wait till you see what she wrote. My name is Suzanne Fisher. I'm from Hastings, Minnesota, and I've uh, been making this quilt for years. It is a primitive gatherings pattern and it's just bow tie quilt blocks and it kind of cracked me up when Susan said that she didn't do blocks really smaller than four inch. These are two inch and there's about it's about seven thousand or nine thousand pieces because all of the bow ties are seven six six pieces so anyway, it was very fun to make, but it took about two years. <laughs> I'm the This book is like the show. And when I designed it, and this is how I think, uh, Queen Side's bed is this middle section right here. So when you're making a bed, if it's right on the top, I need to call my husband because he can pick it up first. And I say, either you're going to make the bed or I'm going to kick you out of it. <laughs> so I'll see him, gets it all done. Uh, it's made from leather from my mom's. And we've done several quilts with uh, one and a half inch strips. And so I have a ton of one and a half inch strips. And so I thought, what the heck am I going to do with some of those? The first quilt I'm going to do is but okay, I'm going to make a pictorial quilt. And this is only part of it. And you think of what the heck. This could be. It's a red spot on Jupiter. No, it's it's. <laughs> It's a big red spot. And it's for my grandson. And uh, after Jupiter, what else? It's supposed to either be a moon up in this, up in the upper part, or it could be the death star. So, so you with your scraps, and then. One and a half by two and a half. You can still do stuff. Have a good time. Things for the beginning. Yeah. I haven't said anything yet. <laughs> um, okay, these are from the some of these are from the quilt show. Right? All of them are from the quilt show. If you're here, your quilt comes up. But no, um, I think Thursday night only one person is here. We showed sure. all these. We showed sure. all these. So um, and I can't hear you. But I can't see. Um, 
There we go, family genes. Is Judy here? What's flashing? Okay, now is it working? All right. It's off. Okay, this is Family Genes by Judy Olson. Is Judy here today? No? Okay. There it is. Um, I believe this was a lot of them over here here from Genes Clan. This was an upside Okay, Diane, that's how right. you where are you? Would you like to say something about your fault? <laughs> Taken a class from Susan Sat Susan Sassman? Yeah. Jane Sassman. And a lot of the fabrics in that um, piece her, her design. I threw a couple of K facet ones in there too. But this took me all last to make. It was very difficult. And uh, but it turned out pretty well. What she had a ribbon. Anybody related to Eddie? That's mentioned, you know, granddaughter Eddie. She, um, you can't tell, but that feature fabric has a nose in it. She has a thing about gnomes this year. Um, so she named it Gnome City. By Moon Riley. Why do you have to go? No one wants Moon Riley. Okay, we'll still be in the book library. Jan Redstick. The light is good, kind of well. Karen, Carol Hamdu. She goes on. She had a little exhibit with about a dozen quilts in there. I haven't seen her today. Yeah. That was a great exhibit if you didn't see it. Yes. Karen McTavish's quilt. Mary Willard. My cohort. Your cohort. She's not here. She did the um, the challenge quilt. Sorry. Yes. First time she ever entered anything in a quilt show, and she won the first place. Yeah, <laughs> good time. She's having fun too. Right. Yeah. Tim Andrews, are you here? She's online. She was online Thursday night too. Wow. Yep, I'm see? here. You want to talk about your quilt? Uh, no, that's okay. Everybody is, yeah, it's, it's a dear Jane. It took a, over 20 years. That's about it. <laughs> it's a lot of impressive She tried for the Judge and not judge for the residence, and she won a bundle of prizes. She's a teacher. Well, anyway, from Alaska, I guess she wouldn't be here. Maybe it's an improv quilt, me, for sure. And then Helen Smith Stone is up in the loop, so I called her here, so she had a lot of lovely quilts this week. Did she want to say anything? No? 
Hi, everybody. So nice to be here. Thank you so much, Minnesota Quilters. It was a wonderful show. Uh, this is a quilt I made for my daughter Sophie and Nate for their wedding two years ago. And I usually use lots of colors, and I was instructed I could use two colors, and one of those colors was white. I don't think it's a color. Um, and she, from that generation that was looking back at the older things and loves the simplicity of that era. And so um, made the carpenter square, I think it is. Um, not just square. Yeah, see, I do improv. This was totally uh, well. Um, I did add another color to the back, and it's green. <laughs> And Marie, I think I saw her today. She was our photographer at the uh, quilt show. She did a lovely job with some of these mystery quilts, too. Um, oh, yeah, and the story with this one, she left it behind someplace and it had to be recovered for her. But we'll get it back to her eventually. Okay, so thank you, everybody. So the first prize is last night. It's in here. Zeb Norston. This is for the uh, well, or, well, or worry less while hanging. Laura Nagel. At least you got it, yep. All right, so Pinwheel Garden and Honeybee Lane yeah, um, patterns. Mary Tag. Okay, the last one is for the star wire pattern and some thread. All right, it's done. Okay, thank you. You guys ready? Right? <laughs> Yeah, I don't know why it was just. Yeah, Lorelei Boyer? Lorelei. Oh, this is right. You still have Lorelei. Great. Congratulations, Lorelei Boyer. Yes. Where are your desired show on there? We'll send you a gift card. Hi, this is Laurel. Why? You won the uh, Zoom door prize. So, if you want to tell us what quilt shop you want on the chat, 
and we'll send you a gift card out. Um, okay, great. I will do that. Thank you. Okay, and the next one would be. Oh, one more Okay. Thank you. Thank you. See you next month.